good. Got some nods. Awesome. All right, so be, before we actually dive into the content, I want to start off with an exercise that has absolutely nothing to do with Python. Uh, I want you to think back to the last time that you went grocery shopping, and I want you to think about the items that you bought, and I want you to think about that collection of them, and how many of those did you know ahead of time that you were going to buy? What proportion did you know the exact flavor, the exact size, the exact item, all of that? Uh, just, just reflect on that for a few seconds and hold that number in your mind. We're going to come back to it. Uh, but this talk is Large Scale Recommendation System with Python and Spark. My name is Phil Anderson. I'm a data scientist at a company called 8451 that's in Cincinnati. Uh, out of curiosity, how many people have heard of 8451? All right. Wow. <laughs> cool. Um, so it's a, few, a few notes before we get into the into the bulk of it, uh, please direct questions to my Twitter account. Uh, that's, the, that's the handle there. Or I'll be here for the rest of today and part of tomorrow. So feel free to just catch up with me in the hallway. Um, all of the code and sample data is available at that GitHub repository. Um, I believe this is being recorded. It is being recorded. So if you have want to go back and revisit those later, that's, that's definitely an option. All right, contents. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit of context for recommendation systems and why I'm talking about grocery stores. Um, we're going to do a technical deep dive. Um, I am a data scientist. This is going to be more uh, data science focused than development focused. Uh, but we will talk a little bit about the engineering aspect of this with uh, the coordination of production work. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the finished product and what a recommendation system looks like on a pretty major uh, e-commerce website. So for context, uh, what is 8451? A few of us have heard of that. Uh, it is an analytic services provider in Cincinnati, Ohio, wholly owned by the Kroger company. Um, and so people would be surprised to learn this, but Kroger actually owns this company that has around 700 employees uh, dedicated to analyzing the data from Kroger's retail operations. So anytime that somebody goes to that store and wants to get a sale price, they need to use a loyalty card. All that information is eventually going to come to our servers. Uh, we're going to figure out what to do with it. Uh, it's going to be a lot of marketing and operations style uh, work. Uh, and then also, interestingly, we do have a pretty strong Google rating uh, for what that's worth. Uh, 4.8 stars out of 5 on 41 ratings. Uh, I actually checked into those just to see like who was doing that. And one of my former interns actually gave us 5 stars. Uh, he, is <laughs> he is now employed full time, so it's so a way to go there. <laughs> Um, we've, we've probably heard of Kroger, but just in case you haven't, what is it? Uh, it's, I think, believe, the third largest retailer in the United States, uh, which, which might be surprising for some people. Uh, it's the largest pure play grocer, uh, and the second largest uh, seller of groceries in this country. And so that's the, the footprint of Kroger. You can see it goes by a number of different names across the U.S. Um, 8451's at the bottom uh, under services providers, so glad we made it in there. Pretty exciting. Uh, so back to our initial exercise, when, when I thought about that, when I thought about what proportion of the items in my basket in my grocery cart that I know that I was going to buy, I would have said probably 80 to 90%. Like I feel like I could predict what I would, what I would get. Uh, we did an analysis and on average it turns out that 30 to 40% of the items in a typical grocery store basket are totally new to the customer, as in they have not purchased those things in the last 52 weeks or year. Um, so I was, I was skeptical of that. I was surprised. So I started uh, looking at my own behavior um, as I went grocery shopping. And this actually started to make a lot more sense to me. Um, so why? Well, a lot of products have a ton of different flavors. If you think about uh, just the wall of yogurt that's at a grocery store, uh, <laughs> you could buy the same flavor two weeks in a row if you tried. Um, so that's, that's one option. Uh, there's trade promotion, so a lot of things will go on sale. You'll just be cruising down the aisle. You'll see this yellow tag, and then you'll buy it. Just, just if for no other reason, that, then it's discounted. Um, there's also product placement. So those are, like for example, like putting an item at the end of an aisle. Um, it's called an end cap. Uh, that actually moves product a lot more than you would think it does. Uh, and people will pay to have their things put on the end of those things. Uh, there's like classic impulse. Maybe you have just a craving for beef jerky. Kroger can meet that impulse. Uh, and then sometimes just, just noise. Maybe I'm going to a social function. I need to pick up some chips. Um, I'll buy those. So uh, 
traditional brick and mortar stores such as such as Kroger have a lot of like avenues in place to aid with what we'll call new product discovery. Like how do I figure out what's new to me? Um, how do I try a new product? There's a lot of vehicles to do that. Um, in a post brick and mortar only world, um, how do we how do we do that? And the answer that e-commerce has pretty much settled on is recommendation systems. So that was the motivation for building what, what I'm going to talk about in this presentation. Um, Kroger is not uh, uh, not new to recommendation systems. The team that I'm on is called Digital Personalization, and this is our entire job. Um, these are some of the systems that, that we have in place uh, on Kroger's website. So on the left, we have uh, personalized recipes. So we'll look at what customers are buying, and we'll give recipe recommendations based on that. Um, we have personalized search. So if a customer searches for milk, for example, uh, we'll show the milk that they're most likely to buy, be that almond, soy, just regular, organic, whatever. Uh, we have coupons available to customers. Uh, all customers, more or less, have access to the same pool of coupons, but we'll rank those according to how we believe they're going to redeem those or how relevant we believe they're going to find them. Uh, and then on the right, we have some other uh, recommendations similar to the one that I'm going to talk about. The big difference is that these are retention-focused. Um, so in grocery, there is a pretty heavy component of buying things over and over again, as opposed to like clothing retail, where you buy a shirt, it's probably good for a while. Um, so a lot of the stuff we do is retention focused. This is going to be different in that it's acquisition focused. So deep dive, we're going to start off with the infrastructure that we use. Uh, we use Spark. Um, Spark is a very fast, very scalable cluster computing uh, system. Cluster computing is not anything new, and actually the most, the most notable recent example is Hadoop, and that's like over 10 years old at this point. Um, one of the appealing aspects of Python is that it has APIs in familiar languages. So as a data scientist, uh, I want to use Python, I want to use SQL. Uh, Spark, Spark provides those. Hadoop is going to use Java. I don't know Java. Every time I've looked at it, it's hurt a little bit. Um, <laughs> but Python and SQL, like I'm familiar with those. I'm good to go. Um, Spark also has support for uh, R and Scala. R is a statistical language. Scala is a language I'm pretty sure is more or less for this. It's, it's uh, functional. Um, we chose Python for a couple of reasons. One is that it is a Spark priority language. Um, Scala is the native language of Spark. That's very related to Java, just in that they both use something called the JVM. Um, so that gets the most support, but Sp Python is a very, very close second to Scala. Um, the other main reason was that everybody's just going to agree on it, and everybody in this case is data science and engineering. Um, a, lot of, a lot of data scientists are really interested in using R. That's probably not the best for a production system. A lot of our engineers wanted to use Scala. Um, we're more focused on quantitative methods than just learning new languages all the time. So uh, that's why we went with why we went with Python. Um, as far as as far as methodology goes, the core of this is something that we're calling conditional filtering. Um, the core idea behind this uh, is that we're going to look at different co-purchase rates amongst items to see what what is being sold together and what is being bought together. Um, so one example would be if I have a basket that has uh, bread and peanut butter. What might be like a third potential option? Jelly. There we go. Um, so that's that's like the the idea behind this. But that that can extend to all kinds of different products. Um, that's probably just one of the easier ones. Uh, there's two two main types of this: user focused and item focused. Uh, we're going to talk about item focused in this presentation. And the the core of this is actually it's not terribly complicated. It all relies on this identity right here. This is conditional probability, just from probability. Uh, it goes by a few different names, like information gain, uh, in different disciplines. But this is pretty straightforward. The probability of event A given event B is just simply equal to the intersection of those two events, so how often they occur together, uh, divided by the unconditional or marginal probability of B. And the one thing that I took away from this is that the the actual processing of the data that goes into this is probably more impressive than than this equation. Um, when you think about about Kroger, uh, we're going to do recommendations offline for them. We're going to do uh, tens of millions of customers who have digital accounts with them, and we're going to produce hundreds of recommendations per week. And so by the time that you get done with all that data, uh, you're processing hundreds of billions of rows, and that's that's the really difficult part uh, of conditional filtering. Uh, so this is this is we're going to go through a, a toy example at the top. If you've never seen uh, PySpark code, this is what it looks like. 
Um, if you've ever used pandas, you're going to see one of the more frustrating aspects of PySpark, and that it's close enough to pandas that if you've used it, you really believe that you know what you're doing. Uh, <laughs> but it's different enough that you're still going to spend all your time on Stack Overflow. Um, and so all this is doing is reading in a CSV. Uh, when we do this for real, we're not using CSVs. We're using what are called parquet files. Um, but what we're going to focus on in this example is the first is the first record. Um, so item one, so event A is, is peanut butter. Uh, event two is jelly. And so we're going to fill in this formula using that. Uh, we're going to see that the third field, item one intersecting item two is 60. So that's how many items in our example or how many times these two things were bought together. Uh, column four is just the number of times that item two or jelly was bought by itself. And uh, column five is just the total number of baskets in our hypothetical universe. Um, Kroger does have more than 100 baskets <laughs> at any given time. Uh, so we're, we're going to fill those in. You'll see one difference in the code at the top um, is this with column method. Uh, so that's going to be a little bit different from pandas. Uh, in pandas, you can say like data frame column name uh, equals some expression. Here, you're going to have to say uh, set the data frame equal to that same data frame, but then do this with column method to create this, this new thing. Um, that, that took a little bit of getting used to. Uh, but with, with these with column statements, we can create three additional fields, and these are just the probabilities that are going to go into our probability expression. Uh, we've divided the 60 by the 100 to make the 0 0.6, the 80 by 100 to make the 0 0.8, and then we've divided the 0.6 by the 0 0.8 to get 0 0.75. And so all we're doing here is this is the 0.6, this is the 0.8, and then this guy is the 0.75. And so we're going to do this for all the different things uh, in in this data frame, um, and then we're gonna we're gonna filter it, and so you can see that PySpark supports uh, method chaining just like pandas does. Um, so we can say this is our data frame. We're filtering it, so we're limiting down to where this particular item one is equal to peanut butter. Uh, we're selecting these fields from that data frame, and then we're gonna sort them. So that's that's actually a pretty nice a pretty nice feature of it, because uh, I think once you get used to it, it's pretty easy to read. Um, when we look at the output of this example, we can see on the left, these are the uh, associated items for peanut butter. Um, unsurprisingly, the top one is jelly, so we feel pretty good that we're, we've done this correctly. Um, the second one is walnut. It's a pretty big drop off. Uh, apparently, people are not buying walnuts as much with peanut butter. Um, on the right, however, we're looking at kale. Um, and so kale and walnuts have a pretty high, pretty high associated probability. Um, somebody's probably making a salad. We'll look at the next example, and it's, it turns out that it's pizza, and that's that's called plate balancing. And so that's when you eat you eat one thing that's really healthy, and then pizza, and <laughs> you you feel pretty good at the end of the day. Like, wow, that was that was a healthy meal. Uh, it's false. <laughs> so as we as we deployed these systems, we we encountered some hiccups along the way. But one of the one of the takeaways from this is that the models that we built are going to emphasize things that in the Kroger store are relatively relatively niche. So if you're buying diapers or other childcare type things, um, the model's really going to pick up on that. Same thing with pet, vegan food, uh, frozen food. I put lean cuisine in bold because when we did an initial run of this, uh, seven of my top ten recommendations were variations of lean cuisine. Um, <laughs> so t take that as you will. Uh, but it's probably not going to be a good experience for customers if we're just showing them uh, like 10 of the exact same thing. We want to introduce some variety, uh, and we want to get them across different areas of the store. Uh, in addition to that, like we know a great deal of information about customers. Um, this is relying just on transactional co-purchase rates. Um, we know so much more about what our customers are doing. Uh, we know how much they're engaging in different areas of the store that's independent of this. Uh, we know their price sensitivity in different areas of the store. Um, and we want to know what is their likelihood of even trying something new in the first place. Uh, is it worth even recommending them something? So what do we what do we do about this? How do we fix it? Uh, we're going to do what we're going to call category trial via machine learning, and in this case, we're going to use something called supervised learning. Um, what we're going to be looking at is for a given area of the store. Um, so say like uh, like bread or dairy or something like that. Uh, what is what is the customer's probability of just trying something new in the next X number of weeks? So based on everything that we know about them, are they likely to even try something 
new if we show it to them because we don't want to show somebody a bunch of recommendations for yogurt if their probability of trying something new in the dairy section of the store is just zero. Um, if it's a lot higher in cereal, we're going to want to show them, show them cereal. So the answer to this is going to be some sort of binary classifier. Um, this is the expression for it there. Um, it's a little complicated. Uh, the, answer, the answer to that was something called logistic regression. Uh, logistic regression is, is old news. Um, that's just something that is going to look at exactly that. Like 0, 1, what is the probability that we can say someone's going to do something? Uh, the difference, or the newer thing that we've, we've incorporated is something called lasso regularization. Um, what that's going to do is when we fit the model, that's going to zero out some of the coefficients. And so when I, when I started this job, uh, we would do something called stepwise regression, which have people heard of that? Yeah. Um, it's like a very, very time-consuming process where you, you carefully, cons or you let the computer consider all these different model combinations. Um, now we don't have to do that. We have convex optimization, and this actually saves like probably one to two weeks in the model building process because it's just one line of code as opposed to uh, weeks of iteration. So uh, this statement's a little bit hairy, uh, but all the easier one to understand is, is this guy. Uh, this is ordinary least squares. What we're trying to do is minimize the distance between y sub i, which is our observed data, uh, minus this alpha and the summation of these betas times x, which are our predicted data. So we're trying to minimize the squared sum difference of what we're actually seeing and what we predicted was going to happen. Um, this, this beta component over here is the regularization uh, parameter. And what we're going to do is we're just going to subject this to this, and we're going to zero out some of the coefficients. Um, this, is, this is a little much. <laughs> uh, in Python, this is what it looks like. Uh, we did not do these in Spark. We just did these offline. Uh, this is scikit-learn code. Um, and so if you're familiar with that, um, the one nice thing about scikit-learn is that it has the same API for any sort of machine learning model, um, which makes it super easy to iterate and try new things. Uh, but the, the crux of it is this line right here, logit L1 equals uh, logistic regression CV. Um, so we're specifying our penalty that we just looked at um, and a few other parameters. Uh, but the interesting thing here is that for a hypothetical model, what we can see is that we have weights for some of these parameters, but other ones got, got zeroed out. Um, and so that's the, that's the benefit of this is that it basically said, well, in this case, frozen, the, the frozen sales, so sales on frozen items, just not important to our, to our response variable. Um, so we're going to do this for a bunch of different categories in the store. We're going to fit independent models. And at the end of that, we're going to have a, we're going to have this array. And so what this array has is P1 is the probability of you purchasing something new in category one. That's the first element. Element two is the probability of you purchasing something new in category two, all the way up through category K. Um, one property of this is that it's going to be somewhere between zero and K if you sum it. Um, this isn't necessarily going to sum to one. Um, we'll see why that's important in a second. But if we divide every element in this array by the magnitude of it or the sum, it will necessarily sum to sum to one. And so this is an example of, of where we're doing that. Um, hypothetically, we have five categories. Uh, these are the probabilities for each of those. Uh, these sum to 2.4. Um, if we divide all of them by the sum of the whole thing, they will then sum to one. Um, the reason this is important is because what we're going to do is use that as the input vector into a weighted sampling routine. Um, and so this is the output for the conditional filtering. Um, so say that uh, we believe that this is pretty low variance. We believe it's repetitive. We want to shuffle it. What we're actually going to do is then randomly sample from this according to the probabilities that we just came up with with those category models. Um, so the whole thing comes together in, in kind, of, kind of a nice way. Um, so say that here, uh, this is our, these are our probability vectors. Um, so the probability of purchasing in category 1 is 0.1 or 10%. Probability of purchasing in category 2 is 0.7. And then probability of purchasing in category 3 is 0.2. Um, when we run the sampling procedure, we wind up with uh, select first from category 1, then 2, then 2. And so what that looks like is here, I first take, uh, oops, First take record one from the center store or category one, that's peanut butter. And then I take the next one from oranges, and then the third one uh, is, is carrots. And so those, those wind up being here. And so we've taken that list of 12 things, uh, and we've narrowed it down to three, and these are um, going to be shuffled every time we run this, but they're going to be shuffled in kind of an informed fashion in such a way that 
is looking at areas of the store that, that I'm going to buy. Okay, so that's, that's the uh, data science slash math part of it. Uh, as far as engineering goes, this, this is a, a team effort, uh, which, which makes sense. And so this is part of the engineering uh, aspect of it. Um, in order to coordinate everything, all these different Spark jobs we came up with, we're using something called Apache Airflow. And I think the person in this room right before me actually talked about Apache Airflow. So apologies if you were on that. Um, but Airflow is a workflow scheduling tool. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like Atomic or Cron if you're, if you're familiar with those. Um, the really cool thing about it is, A, it's open source. Uh, the configuration for it is all exclusively in Python, and it's going to give us a super nice UI. Um, and that, that UI is going to let us basically visualize all the scheduling and all the coordination that we're going to do using something called directed acyclic graphs, or DAGs, um, to give you an idea of what, oops, that's not. To give you an idea of uh, what this is going to look like, um, I got my slides mixed up. No worries. Uh, it's it's going to end up looking like this. And so this is this is a DAG for uh, a toy uh, process example. And so at the top we have uh, the conditional filtering section of this. Uh, this is basically just saying program one followed by program two followed by program three. Um, this is the uh, category component of it. Um, so. Uh, we're going to run those linearly. Those are basically going to meet in that like random sampling program that we just saw, and then we're going to ship them out, ship them off to Kafka. Um, so that's that's a that's an example of a of a DAG. Um, as far as specifying these things go, it all it all happens via Python. So these are just different sections of a Python script that I have uh, that will generate that example. Um, but at the top, basically, you can see Airflow is going to provide a bunch of stuff for us. Um, it's going to provide the DAG operator. It's going to provide bash operators, Python as well. Um, and then it's going to allow us to basically specify job metadata within the context of a dictionary. Um, and so we can see that here. And in the Airflow UI, this information will show up. So typically, these are part of shared systems. Uh, and so it'll basically say, like, Phil owns this. This is the time it's going to kick off, um, et cetera. The other cool thing is within this context, we can actually have cron-style scheduling. So you can have these things run at uh, particular times. Uh, in this case, this guy is going to run quite frequently. Um, as far as as far as jobs go, um, these are specified here. They can be either Python operators, so Python file.py or bash. So in this in this case, I have this guy as a bash command. He's just saying echo cf1. Um, so he just printed cf1. The actual finished product is more complex than that. Um, and then you set the you can set the uh, DAG itself using the set upstream, set downstream uh, methods. And so in this case, what we're saying is that CF program one is going to be set upstream of CF program two, and CF program two is going to be set upstream of CF program three. And so that that's right here. One is upstream of two, with two is upstream of three. And so it's, it's pretty straightforward to, to set these things. Um, they actually, they can get pretty wild. I have an example here. Uh, some of the ones that our engineers have end up looking like this, um, but these these can get pretty crazy. Um, the one that I wrote for myself did not look like this, as we've seen. All right, and then uh, finished product. So this actually is live on Kroger.com. This recommendation system. So if you want to see uh, your recommendations and you and you shop at Kroger, uh, you can create an account there and go in and see them. Uh, I think this deployed actually on Wednesday. Um, so that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, this is what, what mine looks like. Uh, we have some pasta sauce followed by Diet Coke, followed by some kind of milk, and then lean cuisine. Get excited about that. So, <laughs> so, so we fixed it, uh, but not quite. <laughs> um, there's, also, there's also a full dedicated page to this. Um, we can we can see those on the on the Kroger website. This is the this is the home page. Uh, this is mine. All of this is personalized to me. So, oh, it's not. Good point. <laughs> that's a, that's a mix up right there. Awesome. So these are the systems that I was talking about before. Um, all of this is personalized to the user. Um, so these are the items that I'm purchasing most. Um, so it's it's bananas and eggs and celery. I have an exciting diet. Uh, 
these are these are sale items. These are also personalized. We're gonna look at uh, a how relevant the item is to you. B what's the depth of discount on that. Uh, just recent purchases. That's not a recommendation system. And then here's new to you. Um, frozen meals still really really surging. Uh, <laughs> uh, but they're they're mixed up there with some with some Campbell's specialty soup. Um, and then we have we have recipes as well. And these are the things that are that are recommended to me. All right. So then. All right, so that is that is it. Um, thank you guys for your time. Um, I'll be around for a few minutes uh, for questions if you have them. Uh, I'll also just be hanging around the conference as well. So thank you.